If you're joining us online, would you sing with us? So heaven thundered when the world was born. Well, life begins and ends in the dust you form.
Father God, that your spirit would rise up within us, Lord Jesus, for you are the hope of the world, Lord. You are the hope that we know, the salvation that we know is true, Father God. So let your spirit rise within us right now, Lord Jesus. Ooh, let freedom arise. Ooh, let hope arise. And let the name of freedom arise. Let the name of Jesus be lifted higher. And let the name of feeling bring life. And let the name of Jesus be lifted higher again. And let the name of freedom arise. And let the name of Jesus be lifted higher let the name of healing bring life and let the name of jesus be lifted higher See 
Well, isn't this just the heart of James, what we're talking about? That he would lead us by his love, that people would know him through us, through his love shining through us. So, Lord, let that be, let that be, tr be true of us, Lord Jesus. We build our lives upon it. Lord, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not. Lord, we just thank you for who you are. It says in your word that you are faithful even when we're faithless because you can't deny who you are. We thank you that when it feels in moments at times that there is chaos all around us, that our, our peace is not determined on our circumstances, we give those things a glance and we give you our stare because our foundation is determined by you and you are steadfast. We thank you that you are worthy of our efforts to worship you. You're worthy of the energy that we put forward to do it, God. And we thank you for that all you give in return. We thank you for these moments to gather together, to get to be in community together to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's awesome. You guys can be seated. We're excited because we get to continue this moment later tonight. So if you are able to come back, we're going to be here 6.30, having a worship night, having some prayer. And here's the thing. We know that God can be found wherever you're at. So those of you at home watching by yourselves in your living room, I hope you felt God's presence. You can find God when you're in your car, when you're walking down the street. But there is something powerful. There's something um, special about when we get to come together collectively and worship and pray um, so we invite you, come back tonight. We'll be able to do more of this, 6.30 in this room, in person, um, for worship and prayer. We're so excited about that. Um, but we just want to say welcome home this morning, whether you never miss a service, if it's your first time here, your first time joining us online. If you're in the house, if you're here in person, we'd love to hear from you. There's connect cards in the seat back. You can drop those at the Welcome Center on your way out. Online, there's a connection link there. There's also a text-in number. We'd love to hear from you. We do have a few things happening, guys. We have some announcements, and that is exciting, that we have things happening. So if you have not been baptized yet and you are interested in doing that, we are having a baptism class October 18th. There's information online about signing up, or you can come to the Welcome Center. Um, but we believe that baptism is a public profession of a personal relationship, a personal faith. So we'd love to talk with you more about that. Already talked about the worship night tonight, 6.30 here. We'd love to have you here. Um, and in this season, you know, we're not, we're not passing offering buckets, but there are three secure ways you can give. There is um, boxes in the back if you're here in person. There's a text in, and you can also give online. And then that same place where you can let us know if you're a visitor, you can give your tithes and offerings, um, is also where if you have prayer requests, we want to pray with you. We want to join with you. Our staff meets every week and prays over those things. If there are things you're celebrating, stories or answered prayers, we'd love to hear about those too. We'd love to celebrate with you. Um, as Pastor Brandon comes, we're just excited. We're excited to be concluding and not concluding, continuing. Just cut Pastor Brandon's right. sermon series in just, half. 
I'm continuing the book of James this week. I hope to see you guys here for worship night. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, hey, I just I feel like we, we need to do this. Maybe this is the extrovert in me. Um, can you just like look at somebody and wave at them? Just like, hey, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I, I, I know we, like don't, we don't do the whole turn and greet and, and all that stuff, but... I do, I I want you to, I I was just feeling this even when we were here, like, um, there's a part of community that is the church, and again, we want to respect people's space, and it's kind of funny, because like every church survey they do with new people, the worst part of every service is that turn and greet time, like, they hate it, because they don't know anybody, but for all of us, we're like, this is great, for us meaning extroverts, in case you're wondering, that's me, like, it's not long enough for me, I want to say hi to everybody, but... um, uh, again, I didn't do that to try and make anyone feel awkward, uh, but I just, I, I want you to know that we do, we love that you're here, and, and we see this as family. We say things like welcome home um, on, on purpose, because uh, we believe that this is community. We want to be here for you, um, uh, whatever that may be. So we just, we, we, one of the things we say in our heads is like, we like to do life together. Like, I don't, we don't want to live on islands, and uh, so just, that's all. It, you got to wave at somebody. So it made me happy. I, I, it also takes a moment off of me too, because there's times where I stand here and I'm like, oh, hey, I know you. And then I was like, wait, I'm in the middle of a message. I can't say that. And it happens more than you think. Just let me, let me say that. Uh, we're going to continue through James. Continue, not conclude. We're going to continue through James. Uh, uh, but if you want, you can grab your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to James chapter two. That's where we're going to start today. Um, and let me give you a little bit of a recap. Maybe if you haven't been uh, with us the last couple weeks, or I don't, maybe you just, I don't know, maybe you missed one of the two. Here's where we're at. In the, first, or in the last two weeks, we actually talked through uh, James chapter 1. So it was two weeks, one chapter, set up to the rest of the book. We're going to take the next three weeks, and we're going to talk through chapters 2 through 5. The reason that we did that is because uh, in James chapter 1, it really is just that. It's the setup to everything else. We find out who James is. He's the half-brother of Jesus, who he's writing to. It's the church that's been scattered after the stoning of Stephen. So they're, they're afraid. They're, they're nomadic. They're in other places um, that aren't what would have been their home anymore. Uh, and he, just, he speaks to them in chapter 1, just, just says his greetings, but also gives the overview And then in chapters two through five, he actually tells 12 different stories wrapped up with one really good memorable one-liner usually that's there. Uh, But it's all around three different topics. So what we're going to do for the next three weeks is it's not just going to be chapter by chapter. We're going to go through a couple of topics uh, that James then covers throughout it. Here's one of the really cool things about the book of James. The book of James constantly references the teachings of Jesus. So what he's doing in the next couple of chapters is he will reference all the way back to Proverbs, but he'll a lot of times expound on the Sermon on the Mount. You can find that in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 uh, is just the words. I'm sorry, did I say Matthew? This is John. Now I have myself all. I'm trying to remember which one it was, though. I think it was Matthew. It's Matthew. Guys, it's Matthew. I'm a pastor. (laughs) I did that on purpose so that you guys wouldn't feel bad. Okay, sorry, that's not true at all. I just literally had a moment where I was like, oh my word, it was that blasphemous. Can I just tell you, this has nothing to do with it, but I'm about to, welcome to story time with Pastor Brandon today as we start. The worst thing ever about growing up in the church is being a pastor's kid and having to do what we call this children sword drills, all right? We're never going to do these because I have issues right now, like even saying it. And what it was is because the Bible is the sword of the spirit, right? So they would call two people up and they would throw out random, like, verses in the Bible, and the first person to get to it and find it was like, you won the sword drill, right? Which was such a panic for me, because they would always, this still comes back, this is, guys, I'm working through it still. You know what would get me all the time? Chronicles and Corinthians. Old Testament, New Testament, but I would hear one, and I'd be like flipping through the New Testament, like, I know it's here somewhere, and it's not. It's back here, and then I would be like, oh, awesome. I was not even close, and that's all. So, hey, look at somebody else and wave to him. Say, hey, it's good to see you. <laughs> Start off, sorry. All right. <laughs> three points in James. Let me, we're, I'm going to give you the three, three kind of topics over the next couple of weeks, and then we're going we're gonna to dive into James chapter two. Uh, and for those of you that are new, I apologize for the last three minutes. Um, 
Today we're going to talk about how we treat others, but, but I love how James does it because it's not just like, hey, be unified. And we're going, to, we're going to break that down a little bit more, but we're going to start today with how we treat others and really where that comes from. Next week we're going to talk about taming the tongue. It's a big part of the book of James. He talks about our words and how powerful they are, um, and we're going to talk about that next week. And then the following week we're going to talk about how faith, our faith should be put into action. So those are kind of, he, he talks about those different things a lot and in different parts of the next few chapters in James. So this isn't going to be chronological starting in James chapter 2, uh, but we are going to start there um, and, and go through um, this topic of how we treat others, okay? Let's start, let's dive in. James chapter 2, verse 1 starts like this. It says, my brothers and sisters, believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, uh, must not believe in believers. I said that wrong. I was like, wait a second. I'm reading my own Bible wrong. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Let's pause here for a moment and just kind of understand the weight of, of that statement. Because right now that's, that's pretty simple. Like I feel like here we are in our current culture and, and context and society, and that makes complete sense. Like, yeah, don't show favoritism. But this in this, this statement, in the context that it's written in, um, is completely countercultural for what is current, the, the world that they're living in. So they're living in, and we know this biblically, in a world um, where there's already um, just, just struggles between Jews and Gentiles. And Jews look down on the Gentiles. The Gentiles are people who had a Jewish heritage, but they married the people of the land that was, that was in the northern kingdom at the time. And so they're literally, they're called most of the time half-breeds. Like you have, you've tainted the perfect blood of the nation of Israel, therefore you're, you're a Gentile. And it was said like in this way of like, um, of disdain, right? So we, we, and we know about that. Jesus addresses it a lot, even in his teachings of not showing favoritism there, but, but this is the culture that they're living in. More so than that, we are, we are post-Christ now, as James is writing to the church. And if you remember, he's writing to a church that's been dispersed. The reason that they have been dispersed is because they've now broken off of Judaism, not completely, but Judaism has, has broken them off because they follow what is known in this time as the way. The term Christian hadn't even been coined yet. It was like, you are these people that somehow think that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Messiah. Therefore, we also believe that you are, you are a different, different breed, less than. We notice that with the stoning of Stephen. So there's all of this, even inside of, of um, the Jewish culture, there, there's Jews, there's Gentiles, then there's these people who, who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, and there's, there's all of these areas where in that, the Jews that consider themselves like Pharisees, Sadducees, they would have considered themselves as higher. Like they were the purebreds that were there and everyone else is, is, is beneath them. And not just that, that's what's talked about a lot in scripture because so much of scripture is, is speaking to Jewish culture. But even the culture that they're now dispersed and living in is, a, is, a, is the Roman world. And in the Roman world, uh, they're very strong in their class system. You have your upper class, you have your middle class, you have your lower class. You don't really talk to the people around you, especially people from a class that's beneath you, because um, they're just, they're, they're, they're dirty. Like, we would never hang out with people like that. So you have this internal struggle inside of the religion that, that they're talking about with Jews and, and followers of Jesus and, and Gentiles, and then they're living in this society that's so like, like structured, caste system-wise. Yet in the middle of it all, James says, don't show favoritism. Now, again, I love that we're 2,000 years later, and, and we live in a world that, that, that isn't the same as that. Like we, we wouldn't say that we have the same class system. But here's what I also know. I know that in our, our current culture, there's ways for us to do this. We wouldn't call someone lower class, but we would talk about poverty that they live in. We wouldn't call somebody like upper class, but, but we would know where, where they live and what they drive. And while we don't have like the, the fences around different areas, we still have the society that we live in. And so this still hits home today and it says, don't show favoritism. Continues on. It's, oh, it's, it's counterculture. Um, we know that this happens not just, it's not just teachings of Jesus, it's not just teachings of, of James, but, James, but we see this throughout the book, the, the New Testament. 
In Ephesians, we just read this uh, a couple months ago. It says in chapter 2, verse 14, For he himself, speaking of Jesus, is our peace. He has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, talking about Jews and Gentiles, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with his commands and its regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. How amazing is it that the work of Jesus, the person of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is so all-encompassing. Like, it's not just that, that because of the blood of Jesus that we get eternity in heaven. Yes, we do. Like, that's amazing. It's, it's, he's, he's covered all of our sins. But there's so much more that, 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 that the person of Jesus taught us. And it's, it's, it's part of it saying, there's all this hostility in the world right now. I want to bring everybody together. The way that creation was meant to be, one humanity, all together under the blood of Jesus, and in that moment, there's no difference between class system or Jew or Gentile or, or, or different background and ethnicity. We, we're all together under the banner of and the blood of, of Jesus Christ. That there's no more hostility, that we get to live in unity, that we don't show favoritism, that we don't, we don't, we don't have, have, have different things that divide us because of the person of Jesus Christ. I love... Um, that about the church. One of the, one of the craziest things about the church in society that society has not figured out, and it's not just our society, it's literally across the world um, for the last 2,000 years, is this crazy thing where like, there are people from all different walks and backgrounds and, and social statuses and whatever it may be that all come together and make up the church. And there's this collection of people where it's like, how in the world, like, what do you people have in common? It's almost like we don't even look at each other because we're focused on Jesus. And that's what, what the church looks like. That's what, what is happening here in this moment. He's saying, don't show favoritism. James continues on, jumping back into um, chapter, or, or chapter 2, starting with verse 2. It says, suppose a man comes to your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And then a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in, and you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes, and you say, here's a good seat for you. But to the poor man, you say, oh, stand, stand over there. Or, you know what, come sit at my feet. Come, come serve me as you're here. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, breaking this down, the word that our Bible translate meeting, so someone comes to your meeting, the Greek word there is actually, um, if someone comes to your synagogue, if someone comes to your church, more so because of the spread out that it was, it, it would be like, hey, if somebody comes to your life group, shows up in your house, how do you treat them? We're all here to, to study the word of God. We're all here because we're, we're on, on the same um, mental track to, to get closer to Jesus. But instead of looking at what they're coming to try and, try and learn together as a group, you're looking at their outward appearance. And you say to the, the person who's, who's wealthy, who has fine clothes and has, has a, a gold ring on their finger. Again, he's speaking to culture here. In the Roman world, uh, a gold ring, usually worn on your left hand, was, was, a, was a status moment right? There were literally shops in Rome where you could rent a ring for a special occasion. <laughs> so it's like, I really need to impress this girl, <laughs> right? The horse doesn't look great today, but I have a ring, so we're good to go. Like, just, I don't know where that, if that actually happened, but it sounds like it'd be fun. I feel like there's literally places that would do that. So he's speaking to the culture here going, so there's this person that comes in with this, this picture of, of social status, and then you say, you, you, you're nice to him, but someone comes in just normal, walking in, maybe their clothes aren't great. Maybe they don't have the, the same access to, to some of the other things. Do you treat them differently? Because if you do, are you not showing favoritism? Are you not judging them already? Like, not just what they've done, but, but immediately you think, oh, this person must be blessed by God because they've done something. And in this culture, a lot of times, they would look at somebody who was, who was poor or couldn't afford things, and they would say, oh, God must be smiting you for something. There must be a reason that God had you be born in that level. And what James is saying is, are you, are you the judge of their eternity? Are you the, like, that's not how we treat people. 
We look at them in the same eyes that Jesus looked at them. And they were all sons and daughters. They were all worth his life to give up. He says, are, are, are you not being a judge there? And I think the thing that, that hits home with, with us in our current culture is I think that there's a lot of this that at this time was probably happening unconsciously. And I think there's still times even in our own mind where this happens unconsciously. We don't, we don't come out and try to be like, hey, I am going to show favoritism today. I'm going to look for friends that have lots of money. But yet, how often do we then catch ourselves when we're in a moment like this where we're like, wait a second, would I treat everybody like that? And I'm, I'm not here to, to shame. I don't think scripture ever shames people. I think what James is doing in this moment is he's saying, hey, check, check your heart in these matters. When people come into your house to study the word of God, do you treat everybody the same? Do you put everybody on, on the same playing field? Because while it may be natural because of the society that we grew up in or the culture that we grew up in, the culture that we are supposed to live in is not a culture of the world, but it's a kingdom culture. And there's a lot of times that even though this may be happening in the world and it may be acceptable and it may be fine, in that world, we are supposed to be, be advocates of a kingdom culture where, hey, everybody's welcome. It doesn't matter what you look like or what clothes you have or what you drove into the parking lot or, or, or how you smell in this place. What, it, what really matters is, are you here to, to learn and, and lean in? Because our focus isn't actually on, on us in this room anyway. Our focus is on Jesus. So let's all get on mission together. Let's all focus on the same thing together and go after who Jesus has called us to be. He says, are you not in this way by judging their physical stature? Are you not judging their eternity? Because that's not up to you. God is, God is the judge of that. He continues on, just driving this point home. He says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters. We're back in verse five now. Has not God chosen those who are poor in his eyes, um, in the eyes of the world, to be rich in faith, to inherit the kingdom he promised, those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are, are not, they not the ones dragging you into court? And are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as law breakers. So he all of a sudden in this moment gets to the meat of, of what he's trying to get to here. What he's trying to do is he then con contrasts these two thoughts. There's favoritism on one side and there's the teaching of Jesus that is love your neighbor as yourself on the other side. So how, there's, there's this moment of like, hey, we're, we're not going to show favoritism because when you do, you're not actually loving your neighbor as yourself. He's actually talking about saying how you're treating others has more to do with, with what you see in and of yourself. It's not even about just what you see externally there, but it's about what, what God is doing inside of you. Hear this, and this is a way that maybe, maybe you've heard it more. How many of you have heard the phrase, hurt people hurt people? Like people who have been hurt are the people who usually end up hurting others. And that's when he starts to get to the, to, to the crux of, like, wait a second, let's get to the root of favoritism. Because while there's a lot of times in scripture you can read it and you're like, oh, just, yeah, be united. Like, treat people better. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, but again, at the same time, there's moments where we as humans in our human nature will wake up and um, we, we sleep past our alarm and it's a chaotic morning and by the time we get to our coffee, it's cold. And, and then how many of you know, like if your day is going wrong, you end up sometimes like you'll snap on somebody that had nothing to do with your bad day and you're like, wait a second, where did that come from? And it's because of something not that they have done, but something that's inside of us. And what James starts to get to, he's saying, hey, this contrast of how we treat other people actually talks about how we love our neighbors as ourselves. And what he does here is in this moment, he quotes Jesus. In Matthew chapter 22, uh, picking up in verse 35, we see this story. It says, one of them, an expert in the law. Why is it always like the expert in the law that tries to come after Jesus, right? One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Essentially saying, hey, you know what? Narrow it all down to one. Why? Because if you narrow it down to one, then I'll be able to go, yeah, but you don't think this one's as important? Like, how many times do like, 
my kids do this. Like, you'll give someone a compliment, and they'll be like, don't you think I'm good at that? And I was like, no, no, I didn't say that you weren't. I was just I was talking to them in the moment. Like, that's literally what the Pharisees are trying to do to Jesus right now. Like, give us one. What do you think is the most important? And Jesus, in all of his wisdom, says this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he continues right away and says, and this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second that is like it is to love your neighbor as yourself. As a matter of fact, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And this is what, what, what James quotes. He says, wait, love your neighbor as yourself, the difference of favoritism. Can we talk about this that Jesus is, is um, saying here? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it goes on in, in that passage, and it talks about, like, okay, then who's our neighbor? And then it goes and, and it starts to put the emphasis on neighbor. But can I tell you, in the Greek language, Jesus' is, his comment here, the emphasis isn't on loving your neighbor. It's actually on the word yourself. It's all about how we love ourselves. What he's saying is, is you can't properly love other people until you understand who you are in Christ. So what James is even trying to say to those people that are there is he's saying, okay, you know where favoritism comes from? You know where judgment comes from? It's you looking at the outside of them trying to, trying to put whatever's happening inside of you on the outside of them. And what Jesus does, and I love how Jesus does this, he gets to the point, not just the actions, but he gets to the heart. Because if we can actually check our heart, if we can figure out our heart and get our heart to a healthy place, our actions are going to fall into alignment. And instead of James just saying, hey, don't show favoritism, like, live better, be nice to people, he brings it all the way back around to say, hey, you know what? Actually, how you treat other people has, has a lot to do with how you view yourself. And what Jesus is saying even in this moment is, is when your self-image aligns with who Christ has called you to be and you then have, have the confidence in who he's called you to be, then you will treat others the way that you're supposed to treat them, right? Right? how do you love others? You love them as yourself. If yourself is unhealthy, you will then treat others in an unhealthy way. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 hold on. It comes all back to, to how we see ourselves, that we come to grips with who we are, um, who, who God has created us to be. We see in the Old Testament when um, Samuel's trying to anoint the next king, and he goes to Jesse's family, and, and Jesse brings out his oldest, and it says he's, his oldest is um, tall and handsome and muscular, and um, this probably looked a lot like me, rippling muscles. I'm a little disappointed in how many of you laughed at that. I'm just saying. <laughs> and you know what? Samuel's like, this guy's got to be it. Like, look at this. And God says to him, no, 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 no. I don't look at the outside. I look at the inside. And James is saying, hey, just like, just like God did, like, you don't look at the outside. You don't look at, look at what, what they drove or, or how they got here, the clothes or the rings and all that stuff. He's saying, no, 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 you have to have the eyes of God. Jesus actually takes it even another step further, and he says, hey, for you to have the eyes of God, you actually have to make sure that you look at yourself in the way that I look at you. And when we understand this whole concept of what, what James is getting to and what, what Jesus teaches, there's a lot about how healthy we become as people and how that translates to others. We could stand here for the next three years and talk about unity. We could stand here for, for, for the rest of eternity and talk about how we just need to, we need to, we need to treat people better. And then as the, the kingdom of God and as the church, we just need to treat people better. But here's the thing, unless we allow God to do the work on our heart, our actions aren't going to change. And we can change actions, like we can, we can for a day, but for us to actually change a lifestyle, it, it actually comes to saying, God, I need you to work on me. And please hear me in this. Um, I, I truly believe that this is one of the underlying um, issues of our society that's so prevalent, and we keep trying to, to, to fix things on the surface but we've never allowed God, we've never just opened up our heart and said, God, would you, would you make me healthy? Would you take whatever I have inside of me? Would you, ever would you take whatever insecurity that I have? Would you take whatever anxiety that I have? Would you take whatever, whatever 
shortcoming that I think that I may have, would you take all of that and replace it with how you see me? Because here's the truth of the matter, church. That before you were ever put together in your mother's womb, Jesus knew you. That he created you. That he put talents and gifts and abilities inside of you before you ever knew that they were there. And not just that, Ephesians 2.10 tells us that he's also created things in advance, works, for you to do that line up perfectly with the person that he has created you to be. He's literally done both sides of it for us to understand who we are and walk in that fulfillment is how we understand who we are. We start to love ourselves for who he created us to be. We stop looking externally, like we should look externally to let people know about Jesus, but not to try and figure out who our identity is. And then when we figure out who our identity is in Christ, we then can walk in this health that God has called us into, and that then becomes attractive, becomes the the message to others. It has nothing to do with what you drove to get here. Nothing to do with the house that you live in. And everything to do with what God has done inside of our hearts. And when we come to grasp with that health, we can then display that health. We can hand out that health. And I just want to, I want to say this even in this moment. Um, We live in one of the most medicated cultures in the history of time when it comes to depression and anxiety. And here's what I want you to know. First and foremost, um, I am not saying to go off of your medication without talking to a doctor. Not at all. What I am saying is along with the help of good Christian counseling, open up your heart because I believe that a lot of times what we're doing is is the, the anxiety and the depression that we're feeling has more to do with how we see ourselves internally and not how God has created us than it does to do with chemical imbalance. I do believe that there are people with chemical imbalance. That's why I'm saying, please do not like leave this place and be like, throwing all my medicine away. <laughs> like, please, please, please. There are incredible Christian doctors and Christian counselors that can help you walk through this. But I believe that when we start to see ourselves the way that God, has see, has, God sees us and the way that he's created us, that there are times that anxiety is going to start to fall off because we're no longer trying to be something that someone else is, or we're not comparing ourselves to who other people are around us to try and get to that, but we're just secure in who God has created us to be. And from that health, then, we can then treat people the way that God has called us to treat them. James continues on in in chapter 2, picking back up in verse 10. It says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For uh, For he who said, You shall not commit adultery, said, You shall not murder. If you don't commit adultery, but you do murder, you have still broken the law. So here's, here's he, he takes this moment and he, he addresses the law and, and people are going, yeah, but I didn't break that one. That would be like if you got caught for stealing, right? You got caught on camera, clear as day. You took something, put it in your bag, walked out of the store. The police showed up, found the items in your bag. Like you, it's, there's really no reason to even go to court because we all know that you're guilty. But you end up going to court and what you do is you walk in with all of the laws of the land. And you set them down and you say, judge, these are all of the laws of the land. You are correct, I did steal. But these other ones, I didn't do any of them, which means in life I got a 95% I have a passing grade. I got an A, so I should be let off the hook, right? That's not going to happen. That's not the way that it works. He's like, yeah, but you still broke this one. Therefore, you are a lawbreaker. You have to pay the price, the penalty. And what he's saying here is this then puts all of us on the same playing field because Romans also tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. So it doesn't matter who is sitting around you or what what their sin may have been or what yours, it's not like theirs was worse than yours. Bottom line is we're all in the same playing field, right? We all have needed grace. We all are here today, and if not for the blood of Jesus, if not for the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, we are all lawbreakers, which puts us all on the same page. Therefore, who are we then to judge someone else? Because wait, we're in the same spot. Like we're, we're, we're just waiting for our court date too. It continues on, it says this, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Did you know that the law, the book of the law, actually gives us freedom? 
you know that actually gives us incredible freedom to live the life that God has created us to live? Because he created us as people and created this earth that we're in. So this book of the law actually lets us know how we're supposed to live this life that we're in the middle of. It says we're all going to be judged by this book that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who is not then merciful. Therefore, mercy triumphs over judgment. When we have a correct view of ourselves and a correct view even of our own sins, our own shortcomings and fallings, realizing that we need grace and mercy, then we are people who can extend grace and mercy. Now understand this, even Jesus, while he was the one who gave grace and mercy, he was not an enabler. There's a difference between enabling and mercy. Enabling says, God's got it all covered. I can do whatever I want, (laughs) right? I'm gonna just, I could keep sinning. I could keep breaking the law. Why? Grace, mercy, Jesus has it covered. The grace and the mercy that Jesus shows us is this. It says, no, no, I know that I don't deserve this. I'm gonna do everything I can to live better. I know that I don't deserve the mercy that God has given me, but, and when we understand that, we then can look at other people and say, hey, it doesn't matter what what you have done, here's a better way. I was right where you were before. I needed the same grace and the same mercy. I'm no better than you. The only thing that, that, that has, has given me hope is because I understand who Jesus is. Come, let me show you a better way. Even Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, he doesn't say, you're good, nobody condemned you, you're fine. He said, no, 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 I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. There's a better way to live. And there's not condemnation, but there's grace and there's mercy. Now, come on, let me show you a better way. And we can then treat others that way when we understand who we are and what we have received. I want to jump ahead to James chapter 4 as we, as we close because he continues this same um, message of, of how we treat others and, and what that looks like. And it kind of shows us um, how we're able to, to then extend that mercy. In James chapter 4, picking up in, in verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Can we pause for just a moment? Um, There's really only two possible choices. Again, so many times when we talk about the devil, we'll talk about the world, or we'll talk about our flesh that's there. So we have on one side God, and we we can pursue him. We can submit to him and say, God, we want all of you. Or if we don't do that, and we follow our flesh, what we're doing is, is, is following the way of the devil. There's really only two options. I wish there was a third. I wish that I could be my own entity and then tell you like, hey, there's God, there's the devil, or you can just run your own path. That's what the world has tried to tell us, but running your own path is actually running the way of the enemy. So you submit to God, or you allow the devil to be your influence. So what he's saying here is he's saying, submit to God. Actually resist the devil. Don't get as close to the line as possible while still being in God's camp. He's saying, no, 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 walk away completely. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Why is that? Because he knows who's already won this battle. The only way for you to win the battle is actually to submit to God. Let me also say that. Like, you don't, you don't run after the battle like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go after Satan. You know how you go after Satan? Submit to God. When you get as close to God on the process, um, that's how you actually attack the devil. So it says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. And then he talks about how we can come near. It says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Understand this, when we come to worship, one of the reasons that I believe worship nights are so powerful and and the reason that we even experience the presence of God in this place here this morning in worship is because when we come with with a moment of humility and say, God, I don't deserve to be in your presence. God, I just, I know that I've sinned. I know that I've fallen short, but if not for your grace, God, thank you so much for what you have done. It's not because of me. Like, I'm not gonna come in proud going, Look at all the things that I've done for you, God. No, I couldn't have done, I I couldn't have even been here if not for him in the first place. So when we come with that humble moment of like, God, I'm here because of who you are. And that moment is when God 
shines his face on us, and it says at that moment, he will lift you up. How many of you know this? Like, if you try and climb the ladder, it's not going to work. It's not a ladder. It's a stair stepper. Like, it doesn't matter how many steps you try and go up. You're not really going anywhere unless we humble ourselves. And at that moment, God will, will, will place you where you need to be. And we allow God to control the platform. And the entire time, what we do is we control our own humanity and humility. And when our heart is in the right place, God will place us where we need to be. We can't control the platform. We can't control where God has called us to be. But what we can do is we can be prepared for wherever God wants to call us. And when we do that from a position of humility, God will then lift us up and place us exactly where he needs to be. Continues on in verse 11. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? The word judge here talks is, is condemnation. Saying you are, you are the judge and the jury, you are, you are offering your verdict. It does say that we're supposed to extend mercy, which means when we see a brother and sister in Christ and they're going a way that's going to lead to destruction, we step in front of them and say, hey, no, 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 we're going to go this way. I'm not judging you, but I'm, I'm trying to extend mercy. It's not over for you. I don't have the ability. I'm so thankful that I am not God, that I'm not the one saying, hey, are you getting into heaven or not? That's not for me. That's not, that's, I don't, I'm not the judge of that. But what I can do is I can know who I am and the grace that I've received and the mercy that I've received. And I can get to the people around me and say, hey, there's a better way. There's mercy. There's grace for you. Come, let me show it to you. But the only way for me to do that is to have an understanding of who I am internally. And I believe today the, the message for us today and the message of James in, in this passage is actually more about our own self-identity. And I believe it's a moment that when we start to really allow God to work on our heart, we see that the way that we treat others is, is actually more about the way that we see ourselves. And I believe that today, as we come to a close here today, I believe that God wants to do work on, on our hearts, on each and every one of us, to show us who we are in Christ, to show us the beauty and the creation and the love and the son and the daughter that you are, in Christ, to show you your worth. So today, as we close, I just want everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want to pray for you today. <clears throat> if today you would say and, and be as, as, as humble as, as it may be to say, I struggle with identity sometimes. I struggle with who I am. I struggle with self-worth sometimes. I struggle with comparing myself to, myself to other people. And today, I just want God to show me who I am, to give me a, a, a strength and a comfort in who he's created me to be so that I can extend that to others, so that I can love people the way that he's called me to love them. If that's you today, and you would be as humble as to raise your hand and say, I struggle, but I want God to work in my life. Would you just slip up your hand so I can pray with you with nobody looking around? Thank you. Thank you. Hands all over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know even those of you watching online, if this is resonating with you, I know that, that Jesus isn't confined to a room or a building, that he can come directly into your house today. He sees you today. And I just want to pray for those of you right now. God, I pray for those that raise their hand. I pray for those that maybe they didn't even raise their hand, but they're feeling your spirit right now. Lord God, I pray that you would show us who we are in Christ so that in those moments, Lord God, that we can extend the grace and the mercy that you have extended to us. God, allow us to see ourselves the way that you've created us so that we can treat our neighbor and love our neighbor as ourselves. Lord God, I pray right now that your spirit even enter this place, that you would enter our lives, that you would enter our hearts, that in this moment, Lord God, you would just give us a peace that you have created us in your amazing image. 
that you have put incredible talents and abilities, that you have placed us in where we are currently at for such a time as this. And that we would just have a comfort and a peace knowing that we're exactly where you've called us to be. God, help us to see ourselves the way you see us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand with me all across this place? We've been um, ending services with just a moment of worship. And I want you to know this. I know I've said this before, but this isn't just a spot to like fill time or, or cute little moment to wrap a bow up on the end. But I truly believe that when we hear the word of God, it's then up to us to respond. And I know because of the number of hands and the, that we're in this place, both first and second service, that this is a moment where it's like, God, I just need you to help me see me as, as you see me. And I want us to take just a few moments to allow God to solidify, to work on what he's already doing in our lives. So we're gonna take a minute, we're gonna sing. You can stand where you're at. You can even sit where you're at if you want. You can come stand or kneel even at the altars up front. And just let this be a moment to say, God, I want my heart to be in the right place so that I can see me as who you've created me to be and then I can extend that grace and show others the way that you love them. Let's just take a moment and then worship together and allow God to do what only God can do in our lives. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Yes, I'm not here for blessings Cause Jesus, you don't owe Just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Lord, I'm sorry when I've come. With my agenda, I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. And I'm not here for blessing. Jesus, you don't know And 
thank you that your word says that when we draw near to you you can you draw near to us you will be found you are not far away we just ask from this moment on this week heavenly father we would lean into your grace we would lean into your mercy lean into who you are and through that love our families better love our community better leaning into who you are what you've done in us jesus we ask that that would be an overflowing that comes out of us. We thank you for what you're doing in this church. We thank you for what you're doing in individual lives, God. We thank you that you are moving even in the moments where we don't feel like we feel it or we see it because you are faithful. You have begun a work in us and it says in your word you are faithful to complete it. So we lean into you in moments where we feel you or moments that we don't. We know who you are. We know the truth that you are working and you are faithful and we lean on that, Jesus. In your name, we thank you. In your precious name, amen. Hey, if you're able tonight, I already said it earlier, but we will be continuing this. We'll be leaning into the presence of God. Um, and we just invite you to join us. If today you made a decision to pursue Jesus, follow Jesus, recommit your life to him, we'd love to meet you at the Connection Center, give you a Bible, give you some resources. If you're around here and you haven't gotten connected yet, we believe that even though this is a personal relationship with Jesus, it's best done in community. So we'd love to give you information about core groups, about life groups, about serving teams, and help you get connected. Um, but either 
We will see you tonight here at 6.30, or we will see you online or in person next week. We hope you guys have a great week, and we will see you soon.